Welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And we're going to do something a little bit different in this study. We've just completed our study of the whole armor of God, what a well-dressed Christian should wear. And we're going to go someplace a little bit different starting in this study. Okay. So because of that, I'm going to ask the Lord right now, Father, that you would put a guard over my mouth, Lord God, that your Holy Spirit would put words in me that would come out of me, Lord, and nothing else would. Lord, that you speak to our hearts, Lord God, and quicken our spirits, Lord God, with your word. Lord, give us a sense of your purpose. Give us a sense of what you are doing in our times, Lord. So we praise you and thank you that you are a God of revelation. Lord, that you are a God who doesn't hide from us but who reveals to us. So we praise you and thank you for this time we have together. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Amen. Well, something struck me a few weeks ago, and I was talking to Alice about it, but just casually, I mean very, very casually. And that is, and this may sound a little strange, and it may very well be, so I'm going to ask you to bear with me and truly, as I've always said, test Test. what I say. Test. Test. Check it against the Scriptures. And what is truly important is that you converse with the Lord about what you hear here in this place. All right. God, the Father and Jesus has sent the Spirit, his Holy Spirit, to lead us into all truth. And what we need is the truth, because we are living in a time when we are more than ever surrounded by a flood of lies. Mm. I mean, you know, one of the big issues right now is false news, false news. Well, there's never been anything truly unique about that in our times. But something is going on where the truth is harder to find. And more importantly, as Jesus said, that when the Son of Man returns, will he he find faith? So that's the question. Because you can't separate truth and faith. You're not going to have one without the other, I promise you. So it just so happened as I was talking about that, here... I was saying that we live in an age, well, I've been teaching the Bible for a long time, for 40 years. And it's interesting to me that I've been thinking, are we coming to a time when it's not the teaching that is going to be dominant in the move of the Holy Spirit, Mm -hmm. but rather than teaching, Prophecy. Mm-hmm. There is a difference. Yes. Oh, I mean, now it's all obviously based on God's word. Mm-hmm. It is God's word, but there is a dif- difference in the emphasis of what God is doing. Mm-hmm. You know, in the time of Jesus, he was preceded by John the Baptist, a prophet, yes. to announce, to make ready the way of the Lord, to announce his coming. Mm-hmm. It talks in, in, at the end of the Old Testament in the book of Malachi, it talks about how God would send Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Mm-hmm. Another prophet to send, to, to precede his coming again. And then, of course, you know that the church seems to disappear by and large, the organized church in the book of Revelation. After the seven churches, you know, it starts with the seventh letter. Jesus speaking to the seven churches through John, Mm -hmm. the Apostle John, which makes him at the time the prophet John. Yes. Because God is giving him a message to speak to the church. Yes. That, my friend, is prophecy. Right? And there, that book ends, you know, before before that fateful event of Jesus returning with two two believers left. What are they? Waters. They're two, the two prophets. Yes, they are. That's okay. Right. Yeah. So it ends with the prophets. Mm-hmm. So what I wanted to do is talk about prophets, the role of prophets, and what that has to do with our time today. So I was thinking about this, and it just so happened that uh, you know, Alice and I, we have traveled in the, in the past forty years. I mean, we have been to most of the states in the United States. We've been to actually. Uh, I've been to, I think I said 50 or 55 countries on five different continents. 
we have traveled and shared the gospel, preached and taught and, and prophesied mm. all over. But during that time, I have I, I I started in New York. I started the ministry that I have in New York, New York City, and in the suburbs of New York. Mm-hmm. And I did a lot of Bible studies. And it just so happened when we've, we've carried around or had in storage Bible study notes that I have made. And when I was thinking about this, I was led to, and I found this. It is a little pamphlet booklet entitled The Prophets. And if you can see the date, it says nice. it's 1978. 1978. And I thought, oh my goodness. I did so many studies on the prophets back then and I think there's a new relevance and a new something new going on in the, in the spiritual realm with prophets all right so over the next few weeks that's what we're going to look at we're going to look at the role of the prophets what role they play where they are what's what's going on and I'm going to start with the with the prophet Amos okay so that's where we're going to start in this study is in the book of Amos Okay. Is that all right with you? Okay, good. Okie dokie. Okie dokie. So don't mind me, I've got uh, Bibles, 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 and notes here. Amos prophesied in around the mid 700s BC. Okay. And that was a time, now, in, interestingly, and I'm, I'm going to kind of just bounce around here in this study. We'll get very organized in the next one, I promise you. He was from Tekoa, which was a a city south of Jerusalem. Actually, south of Jerusalem, south of Bethlehem, maybe 10 miles or so south of Jerusalem. But when God called him to prophesy, he sent them to the kingdom of the north, to Israel. Okay? Okay. So he picked somebody from a relatively small city in the south of Judah to go prophesy to the kingdom of Israel in the north. So why did he select him? I mean, maybe he was just this massive, powerful prophet of God. Well, the fact is, he wasn't. The fact is, when he was called a prophet, he said, no, he said, I'm just a she- I'm a shepherd and a dresser of sycamore trees. Yeah. We live in a, an age, which is not unique, mm-hmm. of professional prophets. Yes. Mm-hmm. People who prophesy for a living. People who prophesy, well, we'll get into that. And here is this powerful man of God, because he was chosen of God. The power comes from the fact that God called him. And what God calls anybody to, he equips that person to, right? Mm -hmm. So Israel at the time, now they they were facing the Assyrian Empire, but the Assyrian Empire hadn't come down upon them, all right? So it was a high point in the history of the north. Now remember, the north and the south had been divided after the death of Solomon, all right? It split into two kingdoms. Not a good thing. But that's that's the way it was. Division is not a good thing. So at the point that point in time, when God is calling Amos to prophesy to them, it's there's a lot of wealth in the north. All right, there's a lot of comfort and ease in the north. A lot of leisure time in the north. Okay. So the housewives, for example, had that problem that comes with prosperity. They were getting overweight. I call them you fat fat cows of Bashan. Bashan. (laughs) Everything seemed to be very secure. And a religious renewal was taking place. Okay. And that's the setting when God calls Amos from tending his sheep and taking care of the sycamores and sends him up to proclaim God's word. Okay. So the land is Israel. It's around 760 B.C., and the king in the north is Jeroboam. The king in the south is Uzziah. The prophet is Amos. This opens the door to some real power of prophecy because he is contemporary with Isaiah, with Hosea, 
All right. And they were all in the north also? No. no. Isaiah was in the south. All right. Okay. Okay. Hosea was in the north. So before we get into the specifics and start examining Amos or the, the, the Middle East of the 8th century, I, I first want to take a moment to determine what a prophet is. Now, that if I ask you what a prophet is, that may sound a simple question, but I promise you, given the evidence, it's not. Okay? Can I take a stab at it? Do. A prophet... I've heard this before, but a prophet speaks for somebody else. He is like an ambassador. Well, I know exactly where you heard that. Yeah, you know. <laughs> well, so. the, he, the Hebrew word for prophet is Nabi. N-A-B-I, if I'm going to say Nabi, right? Alan Nabi. Okay. Now, are you, are you familiar with the Septuagint? Yes. The Septuagint the is a Greek translation of the Old Testament done. And it, the Septuagint stood for 70. That's what it, it's a Greek word for 70. Yes. Because it was supposedly done by 70 Jewish scholars who translated. Because remember, now, there's a transition in just prior to the coming of Jesus where Greece, through Alexander the Great, has basically conquered the world, right? Mm -hmm. And Greek became the lingua franca, the, the, the common language of what became the Roman Empire, all right? And this led into the Maccabean Wars in, in Israel. So they translated the Bible, the scriptures, into Greek. And when it came to the word Nabi, the word for prophet, they translated it as prophetes. Prophetes. That's where the word prophet comes from. Now, prophetes, pro means for, and fetes means to speak. So that's exactly what the word prophet means, is to speak for somebody. Okay? Mm -hmm. So now most people, I think, or, or, or all too many people think of a prophet as purely somebody who foretells the future. Sure, yeah. They may, they may not. That's not necessarily the role, God, role that God calls them to. Whatever it is, he is calling them to speak on his behalf. Mm -hmm. Speak well, not their own words on his behalf. God is calling a prophet to speak the words that he gives him to other people. All right, okay. So, the prophets had a very real purpose. What do you think the purpose of prophets is to call people to repentance? To call people's into repentance, people's into repentance. You buy that to let the people of, of who, whoever. To know God's mind. Well, that's... I, I mentioned... And he usually that, wants them to repent. Usually. No, not usually. <laughs> yeah. That was the first message of Jesus Christ, yes. was repent, the kingdom of God is at hand, right? That's the first... That's what John the Baptist was... Well, that's exactly that's what, what I was going to say. I mean, oh, you, no, 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 you no, no, no. look at the Old Testament prophets, and that's usually what they say. I said that Jesus had sent John the Baptist as a forerunner, his ministry was a call to repentance. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was his ministry, a call to repentance. Mm -hmm. Okay. I want to I wanna find a verse here. I'm, a couple of verses, actually, I'm going to read. Uh, in Lamentations, chapter 2, verse 10. Right? Okay. I'm going to start there. Uh, I'm, I'm actually, I'm going to skip to 14 because I want to get to the heart of the matter. Okay. In Lamentations 2, 14... It says, your prophets have seen for you false and foolish visions, and they have not exposed your iniquity so as to restore you from captivity, but they have seen for you false and misleading oracles. God's complaint is that they have not exposed the iniquity of his people. Okay? And then I'm going to go to Jeremiah chapter 23. Now I'm going to start at verse 16. It says, God says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Do not listen to the words of the prophets who are prophesying to you. They are leading you into futility. 
They speak a vision of their own imagination, not from the mouth of the Lord. They keep saying to those who despise me, the Lord has said, you will have peace. And as for everyone who walks in the stubbornness of his own heart, they say, calamity will not come upon you. And I go down to verse 22, it says, but if they had stood in my counsel, then they would have announced my words to my people and would have turned them back from their evil way and from the evil of their deeds. I will tell you that if the, the primary purpose of the prophets was to bring correction to the people. Now, they're speaking for God. So what are they speaking? They're speaking God's word. Fair enough. Does that make you think of anything? Sure it does. Okay. Second Timothy 3.16. What is scripture? God breathed. It's God's word. Yeah. All scripture is God breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. So if somebody is, is speaking as a prophet, God has given them a word to speak. Mm -hmm. The purpose is teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness. Now it says all scripture is what in your version? God breathe. God breathe. I have an, I have it inspired. That's what most of them say. Shame on somebody. The Greek word that is there is theonoustos. It literally means God breathe. And for some reason, inspired. I don't know why. This is this is one of the issues. I, I'm going to tell you. There's so many tools. At least have a concordance in your life. I don't believe it. The Message Bible got that one. Right, all the other ones got it wrong. Okay, well, we're not going there. No. We're not going to compare to that. No, and, that and even a broken book. clock is right twice in yes. a day. Yes, okay. um, but, but the point is, it's God. But Mark has brought something up. Translations are, are in effect, prophetic. Because somebody is handling God's word. Mm, that's right, yeah. And they are responsible to handle when this is what God says to the, about the false prophets. God tells you to go say this, and you say, "Well, no, I'd rather say this," or "I think it would be better to say this." You're not being faith, faithful in the ministry that He's called you to. To be faithful to the or, the Bible is without error in the original language. Okay. That's either typically either or Hebrew in the Old Testament and Greek in the New Testament. There's a little Aramaic in the in the old. You know what doesn't make sense is the fact that they do the footnotes, that they have the footnotes, and they have the God breathes there. Why don't they put it in? I could I, I <laughs> Alice, I absolutely could not tell you. She's no talking sense. about she's using a New American Standard, I think yeah. the seventy seven version of the New American Standard. Yeah. And oftentimes they will put a, a footnote on the side. Saying literally it means this. Right. Well, if literally it means that, why don't you put that exactly. in there? Exactly, yeah. I, I, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, I, I speak to all of the Bible translators out there who are mm -hmm. listening to this, <laughs> all of you. Don't interpret for me. Right. Tell me what God said. Not what you think he should have said, what you would have preferred him to say. Just tell me what he said. And it won't be too complicated. Well, maybe it could be complicated for me, but it's, I promise you it's not too complicated for the Holy Spirit. That's right. And he's the one who was sent to, to give me understanding, to give me wisdom. Is so it, me and the Holy Spirit, we'll figure it out. Yes. Didn't they change a kidney to heart in a few There's, a, there's, a, there's, there's My, so I, many. We could sit here for hours yes. and talk about the changes that have been made in Scripture um, that... that make no sense whatsoever. If you understand that God is so sensitive about when he gives somebody his word to speak, that's what he expects them to speak. Now, I understand the issues of translation. And, and I think I've shared this just recently, that there, there's a really good book. It's called The Word of God in English by uh, Leland Riken. And it's worth looking at. It's, it's a bit scholarly, it's a, but it's, it's easy enough to read. And he talks about this whole issue because there are so many translations out there today. And so many of those translations make no attempt to hold to the, to the literacy of what God said because it may be too difficult to understand. 
Well, did you ever read that Jesus Christ spoke to the people in parables? Yes. And the, the, the disciples said to him, why are you speaking to them in parables? They don't understand it. And he said it wasn't given to them to understand. That's right. It's not your job to outthink God. Right. It's nobody's job to outthink God. Okay? Amen. So, if you check, at least check different translations. There's so many good tools. I mean, I'm sitting here, I'm, I'm looking at, uh, I will tell you, I, I use an electronic version of the Bible called uh, Esor, which is available for free. Mm -hmm. I've been using it for years. Phenomenal tool. Mm -hmm. And you can get all kinds of different translations of the Bible. Well, compare them. Right. And then look at the Hebrew, look at the Greek. You're, you are intelligent enough. You are. God will give you understanding. But there are so many changes in the translations that it's a little scary to me in this day and age. Okay? And didn't he say, those who diligently seek me will find me? A absolutely. And he will reward those who diligently seek me. Yes. It, you know, it all boils down to how seriously do you take God's word? Mm. How much are you willing to invest in finding the truth? You know, or are, have you been so conditioned by that one-eyed cyclopean demon that dominates so many rooms called the television that you just expect to be able to throw a button and have it all flood into you and somebody does all of the work? You know what? Paul wrote to Timothy and said, study to show yourself approved unto God. You need to, you need to make a commitment to go and spend time in the Word, to diligently seek the truth in God's Word. As soon as you do, I promise you, He will give you revelation. He will give you understanding. He will give you wisdom. Does any of you lack wisdom? Let him ask of God who gives freely to all men. Mark mentioned, I mean, there are so many different, and they seem like little changes. Does a little change matter? Oh. You absolutely had better believe every change matters because God is careful about His Word. So we need to not be careless about his word. Amen. He has purpose. His words are life-giving. That's the point of spirit breathe. Right. All scripture is yeah, spirit breathe. How did he bring life to Adam? He breathed life into him. And that word breath is, is the same word as his spirit in the Hebrew, or ruach. So we need to get into the word and seek these things and find out. Because from, from, time, from the time of the earliest writings of the Bible, after the fall of Adam and the woman, false prophets have abounded. Yes. They have. And they have always hated the true prophets. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the things that we're going to get into and see, okay, that, that Amos, he wasn't a professional prophet. No. He was a man called of God. And the professional prophets hated him for that. Okay? That's very similar to what's going on in the world today. One of the things is they made their living out of being a prophet. He did not. But they expected him to. Yeah. You'll see that while he's up in the north, one of the priests up there says, why don't you go back home to, I'm paraphrasing, why don't you go back home down south of Judah and earn your bread down there? Like he had come up to earn money or earn his living by prophesying. I'm going to tell you something. Prophets, prophets don't do it for profit. No, that's right. Prophets don't do it. Why would anybody want to be a prophet? They got stoned. They oh, got yeah. killed. You know what? True the, the, prophets the, don't profit. The, the people of God kill the true prophets. God will kill the false prophets. <laughs> So one way or the other, you're going. Why, right. why would you want to be a prophet? It's dangerous, dangerous business. Dangerous. And, and that's a fact. And we're going to look at that because it's important to understand that. So why is it today so many people have the word prophet on their business cards? Why are they so proud of being a prophet? You know what? Look at the prophets of old. What did it profit them? What did it profit John the Baptist? What did it profit Isaiah? What did it profit Ezekiel? What did it profit John the... You know, what... From whom much has been given, much is required. There is nothing more precious on the face of this earth than God's word. Not silver nor gold. Nothing more profitable. Nothing more valuable 
than God's word. Because it is God's word that builds faith in your life, that builds belief in your heart. And that's what, that's what Jesus Christ is going to search out when he returns. So if you don't have that, what, what are you going to do? You're going to try and buy? The church today is filled with false prophets who are, who are making a living, greedily making a living, promising people, foretelling how they will have wealth and happiness and all this if they only do what they say. That's not God's promise for this time and place. It's not. You know what God's promise is? I believe in faith. Hallelujah. Let me just go tell you what faith is. Now, do you know what faith is? I'm sure you know what faith is. I mean, Hebrews chapter 11. Oh, my goodness. How many sermons have I heard preached on this? How many sermons have I preached about this? Okay. Uh, I am reading from the New American Standard here. Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the convictions of things not seen. And people say, now faith. You've got to get it now. You've got to get it now. The conviction, the things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. What do you hope for? False preachers, false teachers are promising that you're going to gain, you're going to get. From this faith. Well, these people in Hebrews 11, they believed it too. Because it says in verse 2, For by it, by faith, the men of old gained approval. You know what you should be seeking? You know what you should treasure above all? The approval of God. That's all that matters. And that's the result of faith. Walking in faith, you will receive, you will gain the approval of God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Where does faith come from? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. What was the job and the role of the prophets? To proclaim God's word. Amen. Not to tickle people's ears, no. but yet in these perilous last days, that's exactly what Paul said would happen. Right? Second Timothy chapter 3, chapter 4. He talks about what's going to go on in those perilous last days. Men will be lovers of self, lovers of pleasure, lovers of money. These are the things that men are going to love. And then he says in, in chapter 4, and because of that, they will not endure sound doctrine, but they'll accumulate for themselves teachers who will teach according to their own desires. Well, that's what so many present-day prophets they're are seeking, playing to. Yeah, they're seeking their own glory. You know, they, it right. says gained approval, but it, it doesn't seem by who. And it's okay. got to be by God. It is by God. I mean, that's, of course. If, but, it, if it came from God, it's, I mean, faith Faith gives you approval, uh, the approval of the Lord. Because it says there in Hebrews that f without faith, it's impossible to please him. So with faith, you're gaining his approval, right? So we're going to get into this. And like I said, it's going to be a, a little bit of an adventure, I think. Because, Father, we just thank you, Lord God, for the power of your word in our lives, for the life-changing power of your word in our lives. And, Lord, that's what we desire, is your change in our lives. Help us open the ears of our heart, Lord God, that we would listen to your voice, hear your voice, and grow in our love for you, in Jesus' name. Amen. So be back for this study. So Please.